Hey gang, that was a nice welcome, thanks. Um, so YouTube, love it or hate it, it is here to stay. People tend to use it as like a dumping ground for content when actually I have a good case as to why I think that content on YouTube should actually be part of your content strategy. Um, but it's not for everyone, so you may take bits and pieces from this talk and you may find that some things are relevant and some things aren't, um, and that's fine. It doesn't need to take all of it, um, and hopefully you're gonna learn some stuff. So let's crack on. So my background is very varied. I worked for a company that most of you probably know, Holiday Extras. Um, I was the channel and production assistant for quite a long time. So I was in the background, I was doing channel management and doing all the UK shoots. Then I got roped into doing presenting, which wasn't really what I wanted to do, but I thought I'd give it a go and kind of fell in love with YouTube a lot more through doing it. Started doing my own stuff. <laughs> Please don't go and find it, it's really embarrassing. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> went on to being the channel manager. So I was producing the shoots overseas and I was also doing the uh, YouTube stuff behind the scenes. So that was making sure that all of our content was being seen through the metadata, which I'll go into. That was making sure that our ads were up to date. That was making sure that I was looking at the user behavior behind our stats and actually seeing that I, you know, someone had dropped off during the first 30 seconds, so why have they done that? How can we change our content to actually make people more engaged and um, get the most out of the algorithm for YouTube? So YouTube was the, um, well, Holiday Extras was the brand that I worked for for the longest time. I took it from 5,000 subscribers, which were badly brought subscribers from Penny Views. Uh, they learned their lesson. So I had to build up channel authority. I had to do some good targeting. Um, and we had to make good content and actually had to be consistent with our uploading to get to that point where when I left, they were on 13,000 and it's just snowballed since then because they have such a good channel authority. Something I'm really proud of is through all of this, all these different stages, we learned the recipe as such to how to make good content and how to have good rankings on YouTube. So through the content itself, through the metadata, we managed to get number one rankings for these search terms. Now, they're not easy to get. <laughs> if you go onto the first page, it's really, really hard. You've got hundreds of thousands of different types of things for these, and especially to rank for the terms and actually the name of the country on those positions. I've also done a lot of freelance work in the, um, in the past. I took a um, musician um, and got him up to, I think it was 11,000 subscribers at the time that we kind of parted ways and decided to do it himself. And then also a fitness brand. So it just goes to show that you can take these things across any type of sector and run with it. Um, and I'm YouTube certified, woo! <laughs> it's 30 hours and then a two hour exam. So, so hopefully you'll learn some stuff. I thought it'd be fun to tell you a bit about actually how YouTube started. Um, it was started by Chad, Steve and Jawed there. Um, that was obviously the first interface you saw. They started it in 2005 um, and they were former PayPal employees and they went on to sell a year later for 1.65 billion to Google. Now do you know how, what actually YouTube was used for first of all? No? It was a dating site. I'm not even kidding you. <laughs> so initially the idea was to upload like pieces to camera saying why people should date each other. Um, obviously that fell flat on its face in about two months they realised they needed to rework the model and hey presto, YouTube was actually born as it is. So, I'm not going to read all of these, I'm just going to read my favourites and we can always go back to the sub point or you can have another look at another time. 77% of millennial females use YouTube weekly and if YouTube were a country it would be the largest in the world after India and China. So it's worth taking note of, it's not just a video dumping ground. So I want to talk about why it's no longer just an option and why people should actually consider using it um, for content. So to me, the magic words are user behavior. YouTube is an amazing place in terms of the kind of content you can get from there. But you have to think about why you go to YouTube. You have to think about what was the last thing you searched for on YouTube. For me, I have rebooted a boiler on YouTube before. I've learned how to get a key out of a door before. I've gone there for career advice. I've gone there to learn something new. I've gone there for a reason and a purpose. So it's all about meeting that person at their point of purpose. It's all about saying, hey, we do this and this is how we can help you get to where you want to be. If you don't do that, then you're not using YouTube in the right way and you're just uploading for the sake of uploading and no one wants to just see content all the time. They want to go there for a purpose, they're looking for it, so meet them for that reason. So I have some golden rules for creating content on YouTube. You should always try and follow these because if you're just making it for the sake of it, you're not gonna get anywhere. Especially with a brand, you need to think about what's the purpose of this content, who's our viewer, what's our distribution plan, how will we measure this, and does this match up to our long-term goals and business KPIs? Now, it may sound really simple, but all of these things affect how you actually make your content, how it's gonna look, and ultimately, what you need to do to 
get to your end user and what you need to do to get the kind of um, audience potential you want for your brand and your channel. Can I ask a you can. Distribution is, you spent all this time making content, you've made it look lovely and pretty, it's what you want it to be, but how are you going to get out there? Do you just upload it and leave it? No. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> um, if you're just uploading content, it's not going to get seen. There's three billion hours worth of YouTube uploaded every single day. So we will crack on with some content types and then I'll get back to that bit at the end. Everyone knows about what's happened recently. I'll go into why I'm showing you this afterwards, but this is an awesome use of a brand using YouTube to get to their end user. If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Stay that way. Because what non-believers fail to understand is that calling a dream crazy is not an insult. It's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest runner in your school or the fastest in the world. Be the fastest ever. Don't picture yourself wearing OBJ's jersey. Picture OBJ wearing yours. Don't settle for homecoming queen or linebacker. Do both. Lose 120 pounds and become an Iron Man after beating a brain tumor. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. If you're born a refugee, don't let it stop you from playing soccer for the national team at age 16. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football. Play it at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player. Become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy ask if they're crazy enough. So now we all saw that campaign with Colin um, and it seemed like there was a massive negative backlash. People were cutting off socks, you know, with the night ticks on. By the way, they'd already brought them, so that was pointless. <laughs> um, they still got their money. I know, right? <laughs> Um, but they saw the share price drop by 2% overnight. Now, the important thing to note here is that their under 35 investment from millennials grew by 45% just three days later. Nike weren't stupid. They knew that the people with the money actually were the people that had the brand investment, which is millennials. They really care about brands. They care about someone with a cause and for standing up for what you believe in. And actually, a lot of people have tended to ignore the younger audience because they, you know, they're not spending any money yet. Yet. Because in... The time that it's taken for people to actually take notice of millennials, they've already brought into brands. Brands have already been marketing them for years. So people like Nike know this and they're already there. They're at the forefront of it. They know that their consumer cares. So they're meeting them with that care because they'd rather take a stand and make more money in the long run <laughs> than make quick money now and not be there for the future audience. I'm going to show you a few different types of content because I want you to understand that it can work for whatever kind of business you're in. It's just about propositioning yourself in the right way. Welcome to the power of Tempe. So here's the challenge. Can we cook for this hungry lot for just Tempe of energy? Off you go. And hello, Ainsley Harrier. Hello, Maya. How are you doing? Are you feeling ready for the challenge? I hope to be, yeah. yeah. If you don't feed all those mouths, there's going to be a forfeit. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that, Maya. But it's OK, because we're going to be measuring the cook on our smart meter. This tells us how much gas and electric you're using in pounds and pence, just like at home. And it'll make sure you get accurate bills. When them tears sit, they're going to love it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Beautiful. Lovely. I'll go on you that. You have used your first penny. Oh! It's this. All right. We've got to go. Yeah. Oh, it's about 18 I know. Then. It's OK. Have a little feel of that one. 
flames. So 5p, we are halfway. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get them all done. Ah. Oh, there it is. Oh, gosh. Ainsley. Yeah? 8p. You're going to have to leave the pancakes. Ah. That's a rule for hunger. I think I'd better put another banana in. Ah. I'm not going to have enough, my Stop! That's 10p. Ah. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! 10p spent. I'll be able to finish the stir fry. They are hungry. Why, are you ready, darling? Yeah. I bet you can't wait to get your noshes around there. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, Emily, we've got to go. Uh, There's still about ten. <sighs> yeah, we're only getting half. There you go. OK, sorry, it's getting towards the end now. You've fed 14 and there's still four very angry, hungry bodybuilders. What do you want me to do with that? So, you cannot feed 18 bodybuilders with 10p of energy. You just can't. For no extra cost, you can get one of these to keep track of how much energy you're using in your home and avoid any forfeits. Just give your energy supplier a shout. So you ready? Okay, so smart energy meters. Not very sexy, right? But yet, this whole campaign received over 18 million views and a 28% uplift in ad recall, which is amazing for a smart meter band. Um, they made this brand, well, they made the whole campaign around four key points for passion, which was music, technology, beauty, and gaming, which is kind of like the main key points across YouTube. But by doing this, they were able to, uh, to target lots of different types of customers and meet them at lots of different points. So mainly through humor, which is perfect, because who's not gonna love humor? Everyone shares, people were laughing, people loved Ainsley. It's all a part of the package and it's about creating that really good content um, to meet people and to get them to recall the brand as well. And that was really key in this because although you may not remember the actual meter itself, you remember the Tempe challenge and that's what they wanted. They wanted you to remember that part alone to then be able to recall them later. Hey guys, it's Chelsea from The Financial Diet, and this week's video is brought to you by Credit Repair. And today we are going to talk about how Americans specifically tend to waste our money in very strange and kind of insane ways. We actually have a very popular opinion essay on TFD about this very topic, and I spoke to the author before I made this video, and she is, of course, okay with us sharing it, but also with us exploring the topic in an even deeper way. Because when it comes to cultural spending, some of it is a matter of opinion and perspective, but some of it also is a statistical reality when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world. So I wanted to look into some of these truly American spending phenomena. As Americans, we tend to use credit more than... Okay, so basically, Chelsea from The Financial Diet <laughs> does a series of YouTube videos around good finance and particularly in making sure that people are doing the best thing possible with their finance. And this is everything from how to get a mortgage, how to build credit, 401k, because she's from America, um, advice... And the key point of why I'm showing you this is because she's a service. Ultimately, her business is her consultations, her consultancy work, her books, her um, downloadable PDFs. It's all a part of what she does. But yet, she does all of this stuff on YouTube as advice to show that she's an authority within this area. So that's really key because even though her direct offering can't be a video, but she can make, she can make a part of it the offering, which in turn makes you believe that she's the expert and therefore that's why you buy into her because you watch all these, you get excited when there's one coming through every week and then ultimately three months down the line, you're like, actually, do you know what? I actually want some proper help. So you go and you buy something from her. Um, people sign up to her mailing list. Like it's insane how much people love her. Um, but also she's a good personality. So again, that's another reason why you might follow her. So how you can be successful on YouTube. I think everyone always thinks that there's meant to be some massive big secret that you're meant to reveal and stuff, but it really is super simple. Be authentic and listen to your community. That is literally the big secret to YouTube that you do all the training for and you do everything. Because ultimately, YouTube is an audience that they're, they're really aware. If you're going on there and you're talking about a subject you're not passionate about, Think about yourself. If someone isn't doing the right eye contact, if they're not smiling as much, if they're not passionate about it, why are you gonna give them your time and watch it? Time is the most precious, precious commodity that we have. And everyone always goes on about, about how the algorithm isn't fair. Actually, it's, it's really fair. It's not that hard either. YouTube is essentially a bunch of bots that are searching for the right kind of keywords and the right kind of metadata to find what it is that you're offering. 
um, within this, YouTube is trying to find the right kind of content to surface to the user because ultimately they care about watch time. Ultimately, they want you on YouTube for as long as possible, watching as many videos as possible. So if someone's clicked onto your video and watched two minutes of a 20 minute video, that's bad content. They don't want to surface that to someone else because they know that person is going to leave in like two minutes. But if it's a good video, it's good content, it's got good engagement on it, they're going to surface that video because they know people are going to stick around and actually be more involved with your content. Now with YouTube, when I talk about metadata, metadata is essentially the distribution side of it. So when I said earlier about when you put out a video out there to the world, you need to think about how you're going to get that video pushed. If there's 100 hours of video are uploaded every minute, then that means that you've got some competition. You've really got to try and get your content seen because people just aren't going to see it. If you haven't done any metadata on there and you've literally made a video about a makeup tutorial because you sell makeup on an e-commerce website, um, people aren't going to see it because you haven't done anything to the back end of it. You might get lucky, they might push it out within the first three days where they're deciding if it's good content or not, but ultimately you need to put some work in to get it seen. So, what's metadata? Essentially, you need to find your video title and make sure it's key and it's there and it's searchable, not clickbait. People hate clickbait and they will take, like, go off straight away. But you need to make sure that it's a good video, uh, video title and that it really kind of is saying exactly what you do, but very concisely, very quickly. Emojis, they're a good use, use them. Most people on YouTube aren't doing it yet, use them. <laughs> make your descriptions worthwhile. So you have 500 characters odd, use it. Put links to your website, say what you do as a company, put excess things in there about links maybe that you've talked about through other things. People want to go through that content and that content is also part of the metadata. So you can be found online through that. Thumbnails, so if you think about it, you've got all these search engine results that come up on the um, search pages, you need to make sure that you're eye-catching enough to go there. So colour, composition, make sure that it's clear. Don't put loads of text all over it because people need to actually see what they're buying into. One, two words maximum, otherwise, if you're looking on mobile, it's tiny. Uh, keywords, that's your tags. You need to make sure that you've tagged, tagged it up. So you've got, I think, 50, 60 tags on there, depending on how long the words are. So use them. Make sure that you're putting what, what's in the video. Um, think about user user. Think about if you were gonna search for something, what would you be searching for if you were trying to find this video? It could be that it's a holiday video, but actually someone else might call it vacation. Someone else might call it break. Someone else might call it trip. Put all of those things in because they all count. Um, and use playlists. So Google have started um, using playlists for part of their search algorithm. So when you search for something, you'll notice that a playlist might come up. Use them, they're really key. It also means if you click series playlist, that people will keep watching your content because it's on a playlist. Um, I've skimmed over this for a reason because at Reflect Digital, we've created an optimization checklist that you can download that goes into lots of detail. Download it, enjoy, it's free, you'll like it. And that's me done. <laughs>